Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. What a privilege today's guest is going to be for not only me, but for you. He is an actor, an impressionist, a voice artist, narrator, director, designer, cartoonist, and he does improv comedy. You probably are familiar with who he is. He is best known for his work on Whose Line Is It Anyway? One of my favorite shows, Impress Me and Impressions. Since 2017, he has captured the audience with his voice as Colonel Sanders in the advertising campaign for KFC. You probably already know who he is. Just wait. And he is also the current voice of Genie from Disney's Aladdin franchise. He has appeared in many films such as Frost Nixon, Apollo 13, The Paper, Viral Vignettes, and oh, he's created dozens of characters and weapons and vehicles for the original Thundercats, which is an animated series. If you haven't caught it, most of us have, but if you haven't, you're gonna be able to find out where and how today. And he is involved with three upcoming productions, including Hunters, Gaslit, and the Big Door Prize. We're gonna talk about all of those. With me today is an extraordinary man of expertise and flair. Welcome, Jim Meskimen. Thank you so much. That was a really gracious introduction. I appreciate it. And, th and thank you for your service. And I want to thank all the uh, service people that are, happen to be tuning in or listening in. And thank you all for your service. We are deeply indebted to you. Well, and likewise, because the things that you're doing just bring joy to so many people. And you, I've got to tell you, you're everywhere with smiles. You always have smiles and you're always just imparting on so much. And they say laughter is the best medicine. I've got to ask, did you start this out in doing comedy with little things as a kid? Were you kind of the class clown, the family clown? Uh, well, I grew up in an acting family, right? My mother was is Marion Ross, who was happy, in Happy Days, played uh, Marion Cunningham, and has, you know, uh, been called America's mom. And uh, she was my my biological mom, and uh, but I, you know, I share her with everybody. So uh, it was not unusual for us to play characters and do voices and and have fun that way. And, and we we did have a happy. Uh, home life uh, with the caveat that my, my parents were, were divorced when I was about eight. So it was a, uh, my mom who everybody knows, you know, is very different from Marion Cunningham because she raised two kids by herself, which I think would have been difficult for Marion Cunningham to do. Uh, but, and, and it was difficult for my mom to do too, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of laughter uh, and uh, a lot of, a, a lot of invention and creativity, which is what I've, I think the greatest gift that my, my mom gave me is an appreciation for just being creative as many ways as you can. I love that. Mm. But this is a lot about her from what we know. Most of the time people know celebrities just based on the character role that they had in something that ran for a long period of time or was very, very uh, prolific and you identify that person with that character role but I've got to tell you she to hear she has always just presented in such a way where you can engage with her as mm -hmm. that America's mom and mm -hmm. I mean I know the difficulties of being a single mom but a single mother of two doing something in entertainment oh my god yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a home run. It's a, it's a grand slam. And, and yeah. And I'm, I'm a, uh, uh, a married, uh, uh, father of one, of one. And it was, a lot, it was a lot of work. So I look at uh, what she accomplished and I'm like, boy, mom, well done. Well done. She's 93. Now we go and see her all the time. She lives very close by still living alone. She's, uh, still smiling and having a great time. She's retired, but she isn't just enjoying her estate and her retirement. And, uh, she's a treasure. So we just try to take care of her, you know, give, give I, back. I love it. And I love the amount of ingenuity and the creativity that you have you were imparted with as a child and then have continued to just that flair that you have given so many people, including myself. I mean, you obviously have a generation uh, in your family. There are two of them that has directly impacted the joy in my life. And I can't thank you enough for that, but I'm, I'm wondering what was your first big sort of breakout 
in what you have going? Oh, uh, well, I mean, if you talk about like public uh, uh, notice and so forth, um, I, I, I was on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and that was the first television show uh, that I ever did. And it was a very nice role. It was, in fact, meant to be a pilot uh, to launch a series that, that I would star in. And so the, it was a very developed character, much more so than normal I was to find out later than uh, normal guest spots, you know, where a guy comes in and, and does a small part for a show. And sure. I played uh, Will's Will's teacher and who did impressions, by the way. And it was kind of modeled a little bit after Robin Williams and uh, a dead poet society. Somebody who thought outside the box and stood up on the desk and, you know, was, uh, you know, would do characters and voices and was a little bit unorthodox. So um, that that was a really uh, I still get recognized from that. And that's in 1994. So that that goes back a ways. And luckily, I still look enough like that kid that I was to, to you know, to be recognized, usually in airports for some reason. I'm, I'm, the TSA recognizes me quite a lot. Maybe they're just scrutinizing people more often. Like, hey, hey, I know that guy. Let's search him. Yeah, I know, I know him. <laughs> so with the. the there's a new season out now um, with the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Do you think there's any opportunity of connection, reconnection there? You know, I, I'm embarrassed to say that that is the first time I have even entertained the idea. You brought it up. It's a great idea. I'm putting my manager on it right now. Get on that. Get on it right now. <laughs> it's a good. Why didn't I think of that? I I'm usually so uh, driven that way. It's another thing I've gotten from my mom is like she will she will attack areas of like, wow, this would be a good opportunity, you know, and uh, but I hadn't thought about that. What a great idea. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see the show too. Mm -hmm. Bel Air. It's called Bel Air. Yes. Yes. So true. So and then from there, did you did you sort of what was your next? I don't know, passionate project. Oh, well, you know, in New York, when I I moved to New York, when I was in my early 20s, New York City, because even though I, I, you know, I decided to be an actor and uh, I thought, well, I, I obviously you can go to L.A., you can go to New York. And I grew up in L.A., but I found L.A. to be very um, hard to break into. I, we have so many spaces out here. There's just long distances and separations between people. And there's nobody walking on the streets that, that you'd want to talk to. So uh, I thought, you know, I knew some people in New York. There are lots of people on the streets, but you know, not so well connected. Um, but I, so I thought, well, I'll go to New York. I know a few people there and let's give that a try. And it seemed like a more social, social environment. And uh, and it was. And so I, I got in, involved in um, in improv theater pretty early on. And that was a real passion for me because I discovered that you know, I worked with a, a school. We were teaching people improv. We were teaching people all kinds of stuff. Uh, we were um, we were um, uh, trying to be creative and influence and inspire people. And and, and that's that was a great thing to do. Plus, you know, the audiences would be there. They'd be there in perfect person. We would give them flyers on the street uh, or they would find out, out about us from our, their friends and they would be right in front of us and it would be our job to make them feel terrific. So you, that's very good uh, activity to do if you're a young artist, I think, is to be confronted by people who are right there just ordinary people, just a complete random cross section of, of people. And, it, you know, it's New York City, so they could be Americans. They could be from any country in the world and make them feel inspired and uh, engaged and, and laughing. Uh, and, and that was I operated off of that for quite a while. It was very thrilling. And uh, we had all kinds of plans. We were going to do improvised TV shows and improvised Broadway musicals and all this stuff that very little of it actually came to fruition. But in the meantime, we were cheering people up, you know, by the, by the dozens. And that was, if you talk to other people that do improv, they, they probably have the exact same experience. There's something very, uh, very satisfying on a deep level. And very, it's just a very spiritual level. I think. That's interesting. I mean, I could feel the exhilaration, um, just not only in the setting, but what you're delivering and the reaction to it, but on a spiritual level, that's a, that's a very different thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I, my, my mode of operation, the way that I, why I pursue acting, why I pursue art is I'm trying to give to other people, give to you, give to strangers, people I don't know, give to my family, 
the the best experience that I've received from other great artists. You know, if I'm exhilarated by a performance or a character, that's, that's kind of what led me into doing impressions because I get ex so excited by these personalities. I'm like, I wonder if I could do that. I wonder if I could be like that guy and produce the effect that he's producing on me on another person. Uh, and that's, that's, that's sort of at the root of it. And I think that's a spiritual thing because it doesn't have anything obviously to do with my body. Uh, often it doesn't have anything to do with my mind either, but it has to do with just a, a person to person, individual to individual sort of communication. I really like that. That's, that's an incredibly different perspective. And I really like that viewpoint. I, I know that this is something that has been an ongoing thing for you. I love to see the stuff that you have out there. I mean, there's so many places to watch the things that you do. And so transitioning from doing improv into acting scripted things, um, do you find that a little bit more, I don't know, sort of confining? A bit. Absolutely. Sometimes quite confining. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, television and films, you probably know this, but they, they have all kinds of different methods of, of getting created. And some are, are, are very open to improvisation. I worked on Parks and Recreation, that show on NBC for quite a while. And and they were they were pretty open to improv. And they, they there would always be a section of the script that they'd say, all right, we got it covered now as written just give us something else, you know, just give us whatever you come up with. And that was like, Oh, really? You feel very valued as a performer. when they say, like, you're, you're going to let me kind of create it. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, other, other shows, like I worked on the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is another wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, another show with a, with a terrific female, couple of female leads and uh, boy, uh, Amy Palladino, she wants you to say everything exactly. <laughs> Exactly as written. And so next time you watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, realize when those people are rattling off all those lines at, at breakneck speed, they have memorized that to a T. They're not there's there's no slopping around. There's I, I, I admire it a lot, but it's a different kind of product. You know, that is a very much a dialogue driven, joke driven show. Other shows, not so much. You know, you have a little bit more wiggle room, but an actor should be able, obviously, to be able to duplicate written dialogue and deliver it uh, as it is on the page. But the, the, the game is to bring your own sensibility to it, to bring feeling and humanity to it and reality to it, even though somebody wrote it down ahead of time. And so, okay, so shifting just a little bit and doing a voiceover work as Colonel Sanders or the- Yeah, I'm I guess I should demonstrate probably that this is a Colonel Sanders voice and I was just using it this morning uh, to create more commercials for that uh, KFC brand. And uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. I'll tell you what, I've been doing it for about six years and I, I hope to do it for another 60. I love it. I love it. That allows you to, and with the genie in Aladdin, both of those uh, things, don't they allow some of your creativity to come out through uh, different intonation and inflection in these lines? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, when, I, when I'm doing an impression, like when I'm doing Robin Williams, the genie, the, you know, the original, this is the one that we all loved. Um, that one, I like to, you know, invest what I feel is a kind of Robin energy into it, you know, which is obviously very strong, passionate, and at the same time, reserved, playful, changeable, malleable, whatever you want to say. Um, so that's, that's my choice, but I'm trying to emulate, you know, something that I observed in that original performer and Colonel Sanders. I actually do quite a lot of, uh, other ancillary material for Colonel Sanders that I totally make up myself. And that's on my YouTube channel. I like to do these, uh, imagined conversations between Colonel Sanders, who's just such a funny character to me. I mean, he's a real man and I, I honor him a lot and I respect him a lot, but he's, he's got such a, he's so not part of this time. If he was around this day and age, I think he would just stand around stunned. But uh, I like to recreate these uh, conversations between Colonel Sanders and other celebrities, you know, like Marlon Brando or Johnny Carson or Ooh. Nixon, or I just did George Lucas. George, I can imagine conversation between Colonel Sanders and George Lucas, uh, where uh, George Lucas is uh, trying to uh, raise some money for uh, a little movie he's doing called Star Wars. And, uh, and Colonel Sanders is being asked to uh, see if he might uh, want to invest some money in it. And, uh, or, or, and I say this, uh, this here movie of yours is, uh, takes place in the distant past. 
That's right. Uh, breaking with tradition uh, just a little bit and putting it in the in the distant past and uh -huh, in another galaxy far, far away. Oh, that's an interesting idea. So I like to kind of like imagine these things in my head and then I record them and I put them up on YouTube and <laughs> it, it makes me laugh. I love this. This is an incredible, invaluable talent that you have. I just can't. I don't know how you are able to perfect it just so astutely. Well, thanks. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of practice. I mean, it'd be like a, I, I think of it like a musician. I'm not a musician, but I like to sing, but I don't play any instruments. And, but I, I've noticed a lot of my friends who do, uh, they have spent innumerable hours on a, with a guitar in their hands, just noodling around, trying out chords, trying to copy different songs so that, uh, you know, if they just walk into guitar center and pick up a guitar, they can do something amazing. You're like, Oh my God, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of what I, that's I flatter myself that that's kind of what I'm doing with my voice. I kind of like that. If you can flatter yourself, you know, that it's going to be pretty well to everyone else. <laughs> yeah. If you can flatter yourself, somebody else might catch on and, and try to flatter you right back. <laughs> now let's go with that for a second, because um, flattery sometimes is, is real. Sometimes it's really a, uh, way to gain votes. And I know that you do really great, presidential impressions as well that's right i've done that uh it used to be used to was the commander in chief of the the, the united states of america george w bush <laughs> now he's the he's a head painter as far as i know the uh, portraits of the, the former servicemen and so forth <laughs> i love this i absolutely love this i mean i'm just sitting here listening to every the different voices that you do and hanging on every word because of how I would not be able to decipher whether it was the real, you know, slim shady, please stand up kind of. <laughs> <laughs> there. I mean, this is fabulous. I, I, this is so exciting. So with all of these things that you've had ongoing over a long period of time, you're now working and have some things in production that I really think we should talk about one in particular. And so uh, let's let's kind of venture that way. Yeah, um, there's a show called Gaslit and Gaslit is about the Watergate era and it stars Julia Roberts and Sean Penn. And uh, it's uh, about Martha Mitchell and John Mitchell, basically during the Watergate period. He was the attorney general and she was his wife and uh, knew a lot or had, you know, was very uh, vociferous, let's say, uh, very talkative about things that were going on that probably the men involved didn't necessarily, you know, uh, appreciate having exposed to the public on on broad uh, media lines at the time. I've not seen the show. I've read a couple of the scripts that I was involved in. I play a senator, Senator Gurney. But it's, uh, you know, these days we're uh, people that are creating for television are enjoying a kind of a renaissance. You know, this is sort of a golden age of television. And because there's so many platforms and so many opportunities and so many companies trying to put up content and tell stories mm -hmm. that they're, um, we're looking back at periods of time, like the Watergate era of the seventies. And uh, uh, I think it's fun to watch, particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm in my sixties now. So I, anything that captures that period, you know, I was, 13 years old when all that stuff was going on. I mean, you know, I remember the names, I heard the names on television, but you're know, not really very clear on exactly what that was about. What and I don't know if this, I don't know if this show will make it any clearer, but at least it's a world that I, I want to see again. I want to catch it again mm -hmm. and have an opportunity to learn from. And so, yeah, so this will be a, uh, is I think a very engaging and fun and dramatic and, uh, and funny uh, series. I think there's moments of great humor in it. Um, Sean Penn was wild to work with. He's under so much, um, prosthetic makeup, beautifully designed by, uh, Kazuhiro, this, uh, the same Japanese, uh, designer that designed the makeup for Gary Oldman in, uh, Darkest Hour. Yes. And, uh, I met him years ago when he was just starting his American career, uh, when I worked on the Grinch. And he was working for Rick Baker in, in his studio. And, and uh, I believe he applied the makeup uh, every day on Jim Carrey. Not 100 percent sure of that, but I, he, he, he was definitely in the studio. Um, so anyway, he did uh, Sean Penn's makeup. And when I first met Sean Penn, I was a little nervous. You're always nervous meeting a big Oscar winning movie actor or actress. And um, I've met many of them. 
but you know, this guy, this fat guy that kind of looked like William Frawley from I love Lucy stood up and said, hi, I'm Sean. And I said, if you say so, <laughs> there was no evidence of it at all. You know, this tiny little, his eyes, maybe it's like, okay, I, I guess you're right. Yeah. Eyes, eyes are kind of a, one of those things where they say the window to the soul. So no matter how much you change everything else, those two things sort of stick right in. That's true. But if there's, if there's contradictory information going around all, all around the eyes, I mean, he's bald, he's got probably fake ears on, he's got a big neck and a big hump on his back and a big belly. And it's like, wow, it looks very natural. Uh, and it's just so artistically done. It's, it's gorgeous. Anyway, he's a, obviously a magnificent actor. I work with Julia Roberts as well. And she looks lovely and uh, didn't opt to put on a lot of makeup, you know, prosthetic makeup. So, okay. uh, uh, you know, I think she still wanted to look, she wanted to be Mar Martha Mitchell, but also, you know, still look beautiful like Julia Roberts. <laughs> I understand. Well, I, you know, I really think that this is neat because you mentioned something that I hear so often you mentioned something as an answer to something that I hear so often. And that is, why is it that Hollywood is going, they, they go back in time to these shows. And I mean, we've got all this stuff going on right now. Can't people create new content and things like that? But you've really hit home on something. And then, yeah. yeah. What is that? What is that for you? <laughs> it's the same thing because I know when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and in my teenage years, I was focused on all of the fun things that were going on around me. I was not paying attention to what's going on in this particular area of life politically mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, you would hear about it and you yeah. catch the headlines, but there it wasn't unless you were really involved with history. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I was you know, hanging out all over Los Angeles and meeting people and having a good old time. <laughs> so culturally, right. I was great at all the social <laughs> stuff, uh, but historically, no. And I wasn't paying attention to the deep parts of things that impact our lives now and why it's so important for us to do that now. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. And I was, I think I was more interested in that world, the political world. I hate politics. I'm not interested at all in it as an adult, but at the time, uh, the, the magazine that I liked the best, which was mad magazine, yes. uh, had a lot about Watergate and a lot about Nixon and the faces of these guys, you know, the, and Spiro Agnew. I still remember how Spiro Agnew spoke with that strange kind of upper crust gangster thing he had and the faces they would draw these faces and i would try to you know i i was drawing all the time as a cartoonist just trying I was like it's so inspired by those crazy faces and all you know people in the political realm say what you will about them uh but they have some interesting faces and and they've come by them the hard way i think in a lot of ways and they're a lot of fun to draw especially if you're a cartoonist so that's i think that's what sucked me into the whole well who is nixon and ehrlichman and haldeman and how does he look and <laughs> otherwise i mean if it, if it only came from walter cronkite i don't think i would have been that engaged I, understandably so <laughs> i think you're right some of those prominent features make it great for cartoons uh, yeah. and i mean any illustrations when you people can do that it just blows my mind I know someone who who used to do that in one of the positions that I was in huh? um, in in the law enforcement area and I would just think how talented it is that this person can do that and then create something mm -hmm. and just capture the the humor in it and so spot on, which brings, you know, it begs the question about Thundercats and how you got involved in that. <laughs> yeah. So I was in my twenties. I was a freelance artist. I, I knew I wanted to be an actor, but to be an actor takes a, an investment of time and, and shoe leather and, you know, <laughs> intention. And uh, I lived in New York city, which was, you know, I thought it was expensive then. Now it's, I don't know how anybody lives there, but uh, so I was taking my portfolio around, schlepping it around and trying to get jobs. And I happened to get a, a meeting with Jules Bass of Rankin Bass. And they were looking for a storyboard artist for this new show they were doing called Thundercats. This is like 1984, 85. 
And uh, I had worked for a very short time as an assistant to a storyboard guy in uh, at Hanna-Barbera Studios. And again, I have to thank my mom, Marion Ross, again, for pushing me. You know, she had ambition to spare. So she would give me some, you know, she would push me along. And she got me involved at Hanna-Barbera through somebody she knew. And I got a little bit of training there. And I did work for them for a short period of time. Enough so that when I went to New York and, and Jules Bass said, you know, he showed me some storyboards that they had done. And, and they said, and he said, well, what do you think of these? What's your appraisal of these? And I went, yeah, they're all right. <laughs> you know, I sort of was disparaging and, and he went, all right, well, we'll hire, we'll hire you then. And then I was really in trouble because I didn't really know about storyboarding at all. But the lucky thing was that eventually within about a week, I think he recognized the the folly of, of hiring me to do storyboards and, and put me on a character design, which is where I really could do. I could do that. I could do characters and, and weapons and animals and weird things. And so I worked for them for about a year and designed just dozens and dozens of, if not hundreds of uh, characters for the Thundercats show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, at the same time I was doing improv and trying to get into commercials and television shows. So they were very nice. They would, I, they had an office on fifth Avenue or just off of fifth Avenue and 53rd street above the museum of broadcasting. And I would uh, take long lunches and, and sometimes go, go to an audition. And they were like, eh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were. He's an artist himself, Jules Bass. And so he was kind of like, I get it. You know, they knew I was uh, that kind of guy. I very fortunate. And then uh, you know, within a couple of years, I, I could actually get out of freelance artwork completely and just shift full time into radio and TV voiceovers and commercials and stuff like that. I love that you're doing those now. I, I can tell you, I've known people who said, who's doing Colonel Sanders now, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially when you go back to our childhood and the things that we've seen over the years. Yeah. And so I think that this is going to be such an opportunity for those members of the audience uh, to connect with you. And they're already going to know who you are with the amount of work that you've done. But let me ask you too, are you, in addition to the things that you're involved with, both as an actor, as voiceover artist. Are you also doing stand-up right now? No, in fact, I'm not really a stand-up comic. I have been called upon to do something like that from time to time. You know, I MC events and I, I have a one-person show, a one-man show called Jim Impressions, <laughs> which, yeah, and that... That contains, uh, you know, that's sort of like stand up, but I don't do comedy clubs. I don't like comedy clubs. I don't like performing in bars. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I just never I have a lot of respect for the art form and people that are stand up comics. My hat is off to them because it's really rough, but it is a very specific sort of trade. Uh, I don't pursue that trade. I pursue more of a theatrical approach, you know, and so I put together a show of impressions and I'm always changing it out and coming up with new ideas and try to bring music into it and you know, other special effects. And uh, and I present that from time to time, usually at uh, usually at my wife's theater. She has a theater school and a beautiful theater here in uh, in um, uh, Sherman Oaks, California. Uh, but I've done it all over the world, actually. I've done it in Australia and, and in England and uh, uh, Canada and uh, popped around in the east coast and um so i i uh, i'm hoping to get it started I, I in fact i just got an offer today so i will be be doing it uh again Perfect. popping around and uh obviously the uh covid thing has really put a <laughs> put the kibosh on getting an audience together for a while there but i think now people are ready to go out and, and enjoy it's, some gym impressions okay. again we would love to stay abreast of all of the things that you've going, got going on, whether it's online, whether it's somewhere where we can go see you, mm -hmm. following the things that, the productions that you have currently underway and all of the things that uh, you're, I know you're not gonna stop. So the mm -hmm. things that you're gonna have coming down the pipeline here pretty soon. Let me ask you, what would be, uh, for those that are watching and for those that are listening, be the best way to connect with you and to stay on top of everything that you've got going on and and just really connect. Well, I have a website, jimmeskiman.com. I can't say that I update it very much though, but I, I, I'm on YouTube all the time and Instagram and uh, also TikTok now. 
And my YouTube channel, I feed regularly. It's like an insatiable beast. So I, I'm putting up videos at least once a day, sometimes twice or three times a day. And I talk about all kinds of things on that YouTube channel. I do fun things like a celebrity fortune cookie, where I open a fortune cookie every day in a celebrity voice, you know, spin the wheel. And I do the Colonel Sanders material. I do that on the, on the uh, YouTube channel as well. And, uh, and then I do actor tips. Um, you know, my experiences as a, as a working actor, I share, if something happens, it's unusual. I thought another aspiring actor uh, or artist would like to know about or should know about. I will share that. Uh, I also have videos of my mom, some fun things we've gotten her to do uh, with my daughter, with my wife. We, we have, we have a lot of content and a lot of stuff that we like to share with people. So YouTube, just look up my name, Meskimen. Or or Jim Pressions is probably the easiest thing, and you can subscribe and and uh, it's it's uh, there's a lot of content there, more than any human being could absorb. But uh, you can sort of take your pick on what what you want to check out. There is, I, I was captivated by it, so I'm going to tell you it <laughs> is, and you are very talented. I want to thank you so much for taking your time with us today, so that we could get to know you a little bit, connect with you watch what you've got going on and embrace the opportunity to grab some more smiles and joy because you're delivering it. No, oh, I appreciate it. Those are good words. Good words. I want to thank you again too, for your service, both as a service person, but also as a, as a police officer. I mean, that's, it's a big contribution and uh, thank you for that as well. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Please do connect with Jim. You've got to see the work that he's got going on. And if you're on TikTok, you can watch him all day long there. But then you got to head on over to YouTube because there's so much more. And I'm going to tell you, you'll have time. There's tons of streaming out there and you're going to. But if you say, hey, I've got some gaps of time, this is where you need to fill it. Because I'm going to tell you what, it's going to pick you up. It sure did me. I thank you all for tuning in, like I said, to another episode. And I ask that you get this information out there to your friends, your family, your loved one, everybody you know on social media and everybody that you don't. <laughs>